Eight-year-old Layla Fowler was found stabbed to death in her bedroom. At 5.10 p.m., detectives arrested Layla's 12-year-old brother at the Valley Springs substation and, charged, and on charge of homicide. Hello everyone, namaste, welcome or welcome back to my channel. This is Amisha Singh Chauhan and if you're new here and you're looking for something fun, dark and mysterious, then you're at the right place. So do not forget to subscribe to my channel and also hit that bell icon so that every time I'm here with a new case to talk about, you'll get to know about it. Yeah. Today we're going to talk about a murder case, the murder of Lila Fowler. Now this case is very similar to that of Paris Lee Bennett's case. There are a lot of similarities, they're not linked, but if you haven't checked out my video on Paris Lee Bennett's case, or if you haven't heard about the case, then I highly recommend you guys checking it out. I'll put the link in the description, so do that after this video. Now let's dive into this case. Lila Fowler was an 8-year-old girl and on 27th of April 2013, she was alone in her house in Valley Spring, California, United States of America with her older 12-year-old brother, Isaiah Fowler. Now, the rest of the family, the siblings and the stepmother and the father were out attending a little leagues game. Now, that is when in the afternoon, the stepmother, Crystal, she receives a call from the older brother, Isaiah, after which she dialed 911 and she told the operator that her kids, Isaiah and Lila, who were alone in the house, they complained that there was an intruder who rushed out of the house later. Hi, 911, how can I help you? My children are at home alone and a man just ran out of my house. My older son was in the bathroom and my daughter started screaming. Okay. And he came out, there was a man inside of my house. I need officers. Now, after this 911 call, Isaiah himself dialed 911 and told the operator that while he was in the bathroom, he heard a man screaming, yelling, hey, I know you're in there, end quote, which was followed by his sister, Lila's screams. Now, after this, he opens the door and he rushed out and he saw this man, this intruder, running out of the house. House, and then he went to his sister's bedroom, Lila's bedroom, and there he found Lila on the floor covered in her own blood. Though mind you over here guys that he gave this information much later during the 911 call. Anyways, before the first responders arrived at the Fowler's residence, the parents came there. Barney, the father over here, he entered the house first. And according to him, he saw Isaiah in the living room with a phone in his one hand and in the other hand he had a baseball bat. When he entered his daughter Lila's bedroom, he saw her body in her own pool of blood. She was drenched in her blood and he held her in his arms and he remembers that one of her arms actually dangled down so he had to pull it back up. Also, he pulled over her t-shirt and he remembers that there were wounds on her entire body and blood was still coming out of it and she was warm to touch. Now, when the paramedics arrived, she was immediately taken to a nearby hospital, which was Mark Twain Hospital in St. Andrea's, where she was pronounced dead. Now, according to the autopsy report, Lila had endured more than 20 puncture wounds and lacerations and the cause of death was shock and hemorrhage. Now, because of the severity of the murder, this case was prioritized. The investigators were doing door-to-door -door investigation. They were asking and they were interrogating any neighbor, anyone they could find on the streets who could have any information on this intruder who was well described by Isaiah. Now, according to Isaiah's description, this intruder had long gray shoulder length hair. He was probably white or Hispanic and that all he could remember from his glance. Now, other than that, the investigators also hired divers so that they could find any information, any evidence from nearby lake or reservoir. They also went through the listed sex offenders in the area and the neighborhood, and they were excluding them off from the suspicion list. Now, during all of this, one of the neighbors actually came up front and told the investigators that on the day of the murder, that is on 27th of April, 2013, this neighbor actually saw this intruder slash this alleged man who matched the descriptions that Isaiah had given. And not only that, this neighbor actually saw this man fleeing from the Fowler's residence. So now the investigators not only had one eyewitness, but a second one as well. The first one was Isaiah, the brother, who was alone with Lila in the house when the murder took place. And the second one was the neighbor of the Fowler's. Now further into the investigation of the crime scene, the police concluded, the investigators concluded that there was no sign of force intrusion or robbery or burglary of any sort. 
Also, they took in knives from the kitchen so as to send them for forensic testing. Now, meanwhile, all this investigation was going on. The Fowler family, they organized a rally and a memorial vigil at Jenny Lund School where over 100 people participated. They even spoke to the media and they requested anyone out there who had any information regarding this case to come up front and give this information to the investigators. I just want to thank the entire community and all of our family and friends for the overwhelming amount of support that you've given my family. It will never be forgotten. Isaiah even said that he was not saying goodbye to his little sister, that he was only saying see you later and there were no goodbyes. Now from the statement and the way he was with his father the entire vigil and the entire rally, it clearly could be seen that he was a brother who was in suffering, who was in pain because he had witnessed his own little sister's murder. Or was he? Was he really in suffering? Was he really mourning his sister's death? Or was it all a facade? Or was it all an app? Now the reason why I'm saying this is because in the next couple of days, the investigators started seeing Isaiah in a completely different perspective. Till now, he was said to be a witness, a sole witness. The reason why I'm saying soul is because just after giving the testimony, the neighbor actually recanted their statement and stopped cooperating with the investigator. During the composite sketch meeting, the witness recanted her previous statements and her identification of the man she saw running away. She also refused to provide a description to the sketch artist so that a composite could be completed. So that meant that Isaiah was the only one who had seen this alleged intruder. Now let's talk about why the investigators started suspecting Isaiah. Now during the interrogation, during the interviews that they were doing of Isaiah, his statements, his testimonies were inconsistent. There were a lot of discrepancies between Isaiah's version of events and the evidence. For instance, according to the experts and the investigators, the stabbing started while Lila was still on her bunk bed. Yet her body was found across the room on the floor and still there were no blood in between. I mean, on the floor or on the carpet, there was not a single drop of blood. So how come Lila, who was on top of her bunk bed who was getting stabbed by this intruder she landed across the room without a blood in between so somebody has to carry her body over there or she would have had to walk really fast but imagine that someone who's being stabbed more than 20 times can that person actually walk across the room so fast without even dropping a single drop of blood it doesn't make sense. The second reason why people started suspecting him was because of a steak knife. Now remember I told you guys that during the investigation of the crime scene, the investigators took in knives from the kitchen and sent it for forensic testing. Now one of these knives, one of these steak knives actually had a human blood trace on it. The knife though was thoroughly clean, yet it was not clean enough to take off that human blood strays. Now the investigators and later the prosecutors during the trial believed that this steak knife, which was bent and kind of damaged, was the murder weapon. Now this knife was not the only thing which had blood trace on it. According to forensic experts, there was blood in the kitchen sink, also on the door handle which connected the kitchen to the garage. Not only that, there were Lila's blood spots on Isaiah's Ghostbuster t-shirt. This t-shirt was found in Isaiah's room's hamper. Now, all of these evidences if were not enough. There were inconsistencies with the version that he was giving out. For instance, sometimes he would say that he was in the bathroom. There was this loud banging on the door by this intruder, after which he could hear his sister's screams. And that is when he opened the door and he saw this man running out of the house and he followed this man, tried to follow him with a kitchen knife. But then he remembered that his sister was in the room and she was screaming. So he rushed in to check it on her. Now, in some instances, he said that he went inside and checked on her and sometimes he would say that he was just right there at the door and he did not enter. Now, the other times he gave various different versions. For instance, he would say that he was in the bathroom. He heard this man scream, hey, I know you're in there. And after which he heard his sister's screamings and he came out and he just saw the man running out. He did not follow him. Instead, he went to his sister's bedroom and saw her on the floor. Now, to add this up, Remember the 911 call that Isaiah made? In that 911 call, when he was informing the operators about this intruder, he did not really mention his sister being stabbed. He only mentioned it after a minute and a half. 
So you have an injured person. You saw your sister that she is covered in blood, but when you dial nine one one, you did not tell the operator that thing first. You waited a minute and a half to tell her that to inform her. Even knowing that if you would have informed much sooner, the paramedics would have arrived much earlier and could have saved her life. All of these things did not work well for Isaiah and rose a lot of red flags. After which, on May 11th, he was arrested and was charged with second-degree murder of his own sister, Lila. Definitely, the family did not believe this. The Fowler family still believes that Isaiah is innocent. Now, the community people, the people in the town, they were relieved. At the same time, they were shocked because obviously, you do not expect a 12-year-old boy to do something like this to his own sister per se. Isaiah, because according to everyone, Isaiah was a perfect brother. He would not even push his sister, you know, in a sibling way like we do, right? We sometimes fight and we push each other. Anyways, it was a shock for everyone. At the same time, some people were upset with the Fowler's family because they believed that the Fowler's knew about this the entire time that their son had murdered their own daughter, but they hid this fact from everyone. Now we don't know if that really happened. Anyways, let's talk about the trial. Now during the trial, the pathologist, Dr. Robert Lawrence, he stated that most of the wounds that were on Lila's body were prod injuries. Now, which meant that they were inflicted while poking her with a sharp object probably a steak knife and this was done so as to intimidate her or to abuse her he also stated that the possibility of multiple murder weapons cannot be excluded from this case now an assistant lab director of california state department of justice stated that there were blood traces found on the steak knife in the kitchen sink on the door handle and as well as on Isaiah's Ghostbuster t-shirt. He also informed the court that Lila was stabbed while she was still on the top of the bunk bed and hence the prosecutor raised the question as to how did she land on the other side of the room. Now to all of these allegations, the defense argued that the investigators watched the entire investigation and the early period while they were collecting evidences. He also said that the investigators were in a hurry to judge and accuse Isaiah. He pointed out that the prosecutor Prosecutors failed to put forward a motivation behind Isaiah doing this to his own sister. Now, in the prosecutor's ending statement, the prosecutor asked various questions and also stated that there was no evidence supporting Isaiah's theory or Isaiah's story of intruder. The prosecutor also raised the question regarding the murder weapon. Now, the prosecutor believes that the steak knife was the murder weapon or is the murder weapon because it had traces of human blood on it. Also, the prosecutor raised the question that if it was an outsider, an outsider wouldn't leave the murder weapon on the kitchen counter or even care to clean it because see the thing is that if it's an outsider if it's an intruder that intruder would not really clean the murder weapon because that would leave him more vulnerable to being exposed and to being caught so that really raised a lot of questions and did not do well for isaiah's case now because of all of this isaiah was found guilty and he was convicted of murdering his own sister for which he was ordered to remain in youth correctional facility until he turns 23. Obviously, the family was not happy with this decision and like I said previously that till date they still believe that Isaiah is innocent. Now, what happened is that in 2015, a California court reversed ruling conviction because of various points. For starters, they said that the interviews in which he gave the inconsistent statements were inadmissible in the court. Now, the second reason why the ruling conviction was reversed was because during all of these interrogation, Isaiah was not provided with an attorney. Over that, he was not explained his Miranda rights or given. Now, to add over here, the defense attorney stated that there was a new DNA evidence which was added to the case. Now, according to the defense attorney, the forensic team actually found a male DNA on Lila's hair which was found on her body. Now, this male DNA did not match with Isaiah or with Barney the father or with any of the investigators, paramedics, first responders or anyone who investigated this case. So till date, 
We have no information, we have no idea whose male DNA it was. Further to be added over here is that the defense attorney said that the inconsistencies that were found in Isaiah's statements during the interrogation could have been caused because of the presence of the father, Barney Fowler. In one of the interrogations, actually in the last interrogation, Barney could be heard saying, this is the deal, they have evidence that points back to you. What I want us to talk about is that for some reason there was an accident and for some reason you did hurt your sister, you got to talk to him. Now just tell him, yes, you you did it and what the deal is. We can't move forward with this without you either admitting to it that you did it or they are going to get their evidence together and they are still going to come and eventually arrest you and it's going to be a big scene. There's no proof that anybody has entered our home so basically everything comes back to you. End quote. Now from this statement we can say that there is a chance of little Isaiah being influenced. I turned Isaiah in. Most people don't know that. Anyways, a new trial was set up and this time defense attorney came up stronger with their evidences. They had a report from an emergency medical technician which was taken at 2.30 p.m. the very same day the murder took place. Now, according to this report, when the medical technician touched Lila's body, her body was still warm. Other than that, they also had the paramedics report which indicated a capillary refill test. Now, this is a field test. So what happens over here is that they apply pressure to the fingernails to see how quickly blood returns to the tissue, which was less than two seconds in Lila's case, which is similar to that of a living person. Now, if this is true, then it goes on destroying prosecutor's allegation that Isaiah murdered his sister Lila around 10 a.m. on 27th of April 2013 and died 911 couple of hours later, that is somewhere around 2, 1.30 to 2 p.m. And in between, he was cleaning up the entire crime scene. Now, even with all of these evidences from the defense attorney's side, Isaiah Fowler was convicted again with second degree murder of his own sister. This time, his sentence was increased to two years. So that means he was ordered to remain in youth correctional facility until the age of 25. Now, according to the father, Barney Fowler, he was not really expecting other than this. He had a feeling that in the end of the day, justice would not be given to either Lila or to Isaiah. Their Fowler family still believe till date that Isaiah is innocent. In fact, Priscilla, biological mother of Lila and Isaiah, still believes that her son could never kill her own daughter. I was the first one in that house. I saw his demeanor. I've seen the way he carried himself the two weeks he was out after that. I don't think he did it. Now, these were the events that took place in this case. Now, let's talk about Isaiah being innocent or not for a second. Now, if you see Isaiah as innocent over here, there are a lot of things that just does not add up. For example, his version of the events. Now, according to him, he was in the bathroom when he heard this intruder screaming and he came outside and he saw this intruder running out. Now, how is it a possibility that he heard the scream, he immediately ran outside and still this intruder stabbed the little girl 20 times, took her out of the bunk bed, laid her on the other side of the room, cleaned the entire crime scene, also the murder weapon, placed it on the countertop of the kitchen and then rushed out of the house. Because if you see these events, it's going to take a lot of time. And how come in all of these things when it was happening, Isaiah did not notice. He only noticed it when the intruder was running out. So where was Isaiah when his sister got stabbed? And what was he doing when the intruder was cleaning the crime scene and cleaning the murder weapon as well? That is something that just does not add up. Now, on the other hand, if he is really guilty, then what about the male DNA that was found on her head, which was on her body? Whom did it belong to? Now, the thing is that till date, even after two trials, the prosecutors or the investigators who believe that Isaiah is the one who murdered his own sister, they failed to put forward a motivation. So what was the reason why he did it? Now, if you personally ask me over here, I believe, okay, the thing is, I do not really know what exactly happened. I believe that there is a lot of information that we are not being provided. And if I have access to all of these evidences and information, then I might come to a conclusion. But right now, I'm not really sure. I mean, there are some things that point towards Isaiah being the convict. But on the other hand, he can also be innocent. 
Now, remember over here that one of the neighbors, he actually stated that the entire day when the murder took place, he was out in his garden with his dog and his dog would bark every time someone would walk down the street. And that day, the dog did not bark. So according to this neighbor, there was no outsider in the Fowler's residence or their premises. Lives right across the street from Layla's house. He says he was in his front yard when the murder happened. Nobody came out that door, plain and simple. I got a... German wolf, 95 pounds. Every time somebody walks down that street, they start barking. When this all happened, there was no barks. Nothing. So who did it? The question comes, who did it? Was it desire or was it really an outsider? And what was the motivation behind this? Because there's definitely got to be a motivation. This little girl was stabbed 20 times. It was brutal. And if it would have been an outsider, if it would have been a burglary or something of the sort, then the intruder would have just stabbed once or twice. But whoever did it had a motive. Also, I forgot to mention this part. During the trial, it also was stated that there was no evidence of sexual abuse and there was no semen found on her body. So that category also gets out of this case. Now, here we come to the end of this case and I would like to raise this question. I would ask you this question and I want your opinion, your views on it. Who do you think murdered Lila Fowler? Do you think it is a Zaya or do you think it's an outsider? Because see, in the end of the day, whoever did it, Lila is no more. A father or a mother lost their two kids the very same day. And if Isaiah is innocent, it is sad that he is behind the bars because trust me, a lot of times it has happened that an innocent man gets convicted and much later after this man serves most of his sentence, the law enforcement finds out that this person was actually innocent. And if this has happened to Isaiah, it is really sad. And if not, it is really sad over to the fact that the person who actually did the murder is a free man. Now, I would love to know your opinion on this. Also, if you found this video informative, do hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't. That's all for the day. Take care and be happy and spread positivity. Bye-bye.